All right, fantastic. So, uh, welcome to another episode of Sledge Underground. It's myself, Marcel, and I know introduce yourself and what it is you do to the people who might not know who you are. Yes, I I'm Anna Carstens, and I am I'm a professional wannabe tennis player, wannabe horse aficionado, and archaeologist and scientist. But for most people, they just call me Doctor Carstens. You didn't see that one coming. No, no, that okay. one called me a guy completely. <laughs> <laughs> All right, cool. We can we can do it. We could do it in, in, again. I'll, I'll I'll get to the point. <laughs> so hi, I I'm Arno Carsons and I'm a musician. I've been a musician my whole life, and I've been doing it professionally for thirty years. Started out with the Springbok New Girl Band, then went solo, then back with the Springbok New Girls and solo, and then just doing anything artistically to make money. That's my mission in life. No, absolutely. I mean, you said you've been doing this for 30 years. Uh, Springbok New Girls started in 94. That's one hell of a track record to have for 30 years of experience in the South African music scene and also playing elsewhere with a whole bunch of big names as well. If you could summarize that, that 30 years into a couple of words, what would that be? That's 30 years of being quite in a, in a, in a, in a lucky situation where the people... That when we started out, as uh, the people enjoyed what we were doing. Thank God for that, because otherwise we wouldn't have gone anywhere. Somehow that created enough money to cr- create albums. You know, it created means to actually do what we wanted to do when we were school kids. And that is to m- make music and make art. I'm one of those lucky people that's been doing the same things, uh, the s- same cool stuff that what I've been doing since I was 16, 15, you know. So we, when the Springbok News Girl started, you you were 15, 16 years old. You started, you started out in high school. No, I started writing music when I was about 15, 16. So the News Girl started when I was about 20, 22, 23. But I've been writing music for since 15. Damn, that's a, it's a, it's a one hell of a, a track record. That's impressive. <laughs> Well, it's only because our radio, our radio stations were so crap. <laughs> you needed to do something better. I literally, I used to listen to radio and used to go, oh, God, man, I can write a better song than this. This is fucking terrible. Thank God to South African shitty radio stations. It's actually a big inspiration for. Absolutely. I mean, like, one of the biggest things is that if hopefully things should inspire you to do better. And if you can do better, why not? And inspire other people to do better. It creates little pockets of gangs in small towns. Or oh, that was the, the, my experience when we were younger. Um, so I had two friends. We would import music from we will import music from the UK and Europe and America. Stuff that you can't get in South Africa. And well, you know, it was it was quite a, a niche club of the cool kids. You create your own little world. So music was much more than just a than just background music, it was a bit of a social club in a weird way. The way we grew up in our relationship with music it was probably different today. It's a lot easier to just these days uh, sort of isolate yourself with music. You don't really have to, to meet people. You can just kind of sit in your room and either make music or find whatever it is you're looking for, with like the click of a few buttons. People these days are so, uh, I think the kids these days are much more into gaming. I mean, gaming is much bigger than music and they, the, you know, the social interaction happens on gaming where they're sitting alone at home, but they actually in a massive group of kids talking and music is just a backdrop for it, actually. I don't know. I think uh, music would also be a big, uh, a big part of that. I mean, like I'm, I'm kind of the, the in-between generation there. I do spend a lot of time uh, playing games and with friends and stuff like that. And I know a lot of us are musicians ourselves. And we, oh, really? we tend, okay. yeah, we tend to communicate that way. There's a couple of uh, streamers out there who sort of merge their content as music and gamers, and it's, it's a very interesting mix of how they 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 do that. If you can get your music on, onto the gamer thing, it's very cool. Um, you know, Springbok Noodles had a song called Gang Gang, and somebody made a music video out of it by using. You can check it now on YouTube. It's some game. And I mean, it's fantastic when a song sits well with the action of a game graphics. It's I fucking love it. So I wish they would do more of that. I think that would call be called a um, an AMV, and by the looks of it, it was to Final Fantasy. That's pretty sick. 
Yeah, it's very cool, man. Are you allowed to do that? Doesn't isn't I'm sure Final Fantasy. I mean, we didn't do it, so but it's quite cool. You you guys would obviously have the right like for copyright claim versus against this, and I think Final Fantasy because it's uh it falls under what's fair use, so they're they're shaping and they're changing it. So like the whole internet fair use policies, I think for the sake of the Final Fantasy side of things, that would count as fair use. But for you guys, all right. Be, you could just because it's your song in its entirety posted up on a different youtube channel i mean that's you know something that you guys could claim as a most likely uh you guys are under a label correct yes and i'm actually quite uh it's quite i'm quite amused that sony didn't pick up on that but you know i i definitely i i think it's done more good than bad and um that is you know a thing that i'm not very mad about about big record companies is when you when your music is on there they just shut it off which is quite crap I mean, like in some in some circumstances, that depending on what the person's trying to do, like if it's transformative, where they're they're using it in a different context and using it in a sort of a different art form, you know, that kind of makes sense. But you do get people. The reason why it exists in the first place is for people taking advantage of it, like sort of monetizing those videos, and then now they're making money off of, say, for instance, your music. That can be frustrating. Yeah, but what the the problem with big with the problem with big record companies is, is that there's blanket rules. Yes. Yeah. And the fact is, uh, every region is so different. Some artists, it might be in their interest to put their music onto Facebook. You know, I don't or or or, or TikTok. You know, you can you can totally break break people like that, and then. And uh, I'm I'm not 100 percent sure, but if, for instance, if you just take one of my songs and you put a thing onto it and you put it out there, they will just Sony will pick up on it and they will just instantly take off the the thing. Which, in some circumstances, I think you should be a bit more playing the game of being creative if you're in that sphere of work. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, there are there are certain exceptions to it, and I do agree with you that blanket approach can be uh, more detrimental, Stif- stifling. Yeah. yeah. I mean, there was the whole thing with UMG recently where they removed uh, pretty much the Universal Music Group, where they removed all of their music from TikTok, for example. And none of the artists had a say in that. And a lot of the artists had been spending money to market themselves on TikTok only for all of their sounds to be removed. And that's caused a huge backlash. Yeah, that sounds like a box of chocolates. (laughs) Yeah, so people, there were a whole bunch of artists, obviously, you know, that the how UMG covers like thousands, if not tens of thousands of artists. And it's not like they had a say in that. And then suddenly, boom, all, all that money wasted because now they're, their main platform for marketing, their music. Well, that's bad communication, number one. You should have let your artists know you're going to do that. I don't know. Once again, you see these smaller artists, not everybody's Beyonce. That is the, the fun part about being um, on your own and not with a record company is the kind of guerrilla warfare tactics of um, doing business of selling your music so um, I've got a couple of albums that is not with record companies what I did with my last one is when I launched it I did kind of a stream a shitty stream but what I did is I recorded us all the songs were on click and we played it in the format of the album and I recorded us playing it in front of a massive green screen then I mixed down the live versions and i made a video of each song and then then i sell the song as a nft the video as an nft and i sell the song as an nft and then you make enough money to record another song i would never have even considered that possible i I do have to ask though like what what's it like having known to or god how do i word this but having written like a song that kind of became legendary in the south african scene like with another universe and you know there's still people who have like super fond memories of that song like if you go and look at any other comments on say for instance the youtube video of that song where people have so many memories over so many years attached to that song and it's something that most south africans would recognize because it was obviously used in that advert that one volkswagen ad advert back in the day look that ad made it oh right. uh, sometimes say that volkswagen saved my career and david Kramer's career <laughs> <laughs> Were things not going well prior to then, or no? I mean, you we were we were all coasting, but then when when the, when our songs got put onto Volkswagen ads, 
it really worked. Uh, it, did, it, it, it propelled you up a, a couple of notches into the psyche of the South African psyche. You know what I mean? Uh, basically, I brought out the album. I had two friends that paid for the album. No, no record company was interested. And then that was the first single and nobody wanted to play it. Then a guy put it on, a, on the ad and then suddenly everybody started playing it. But prior to that, I always knew it was a really good song. I wonder how that person, that person who turned you down, felt about that suddenly becoming one of the biggest, you know, one of the biggest hits of its time. Like especially like within the local scene, like I would have loved to see it, to know that conversation. But you know what? One of our biggest radio stations. It's so interesting. Like for instance, you know, "Sex on Fire" that song. Yeah. It was like massive all over the world, but it wasn't played on Radio Five. Who, oh, then there was the Iron Man promo that had Iron uh, uh, ACDC in it. And Radio 5 also said, no, they don't want to, they don't like the music, the music doesn't fit them. So they, you know, it's just these fucking short sighted, weird, crazy shit. Yeah, I get you. I get what, I get, I get what you're saying, like with it being short sighted. And it feels more like someone's just personal power plays and an actual overall, like, well thought out decision. It seems like someone just, especially when it comes down to that, where it seems like a very specific type of thing that's being excluded and then being included later when it becomes a big deal. Yeah, it's 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 it's, um, it's spineless. You know, the the thing is, there was a music explosion in the nineties, basically thanks to Barney Simon. Right? He did it all on his own because there was a, a connection between the live scene and. He would advertise where the gigs were and he would play the music. So there was this big synergy and it was the radio. I don't know, but that was really quite amazing. We kind of need something like that again. I think Ronnie Simon was like one of the first like advocates of local alternative music. Like he was just, like you said, he was, he was that connection between sort of the mainstream and the playability of it to the actual artists themselves versus the public yeah i think what the, what we need in a way is you in, in europe you get a thing called song kick <clears throat> and that is if you go on it you can check out where all the bands are playing now in where we live there's no more real radio uh your radio isn't really very good and uh, there's no more real newspaper nobody advertises nobody listens to radio yeah um there's no more a focal point of where you can create new artists or stuff like that or advertise except for on Facebook or your own sites. So what we need is in a way like a app, a entertainment app where you, if you're into to theater, ballet, art exhibitions or whatever, connect it to map on your, of the, of the country. And then artists will just for free put on wherever, what is happening, where, and wherever you drive, it will alert you to where, what is happening it depends on what you're into and stuff like that. I think that's a very cool idea. That would be a rad idea. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. And what you can get is you can get, you know, you get the standard bank artists or you get, you know, get banks that is very much into the art upliftment of South African art and culture and stuff like that. You get them to invest in it. So it becomes a nonprofit thing type of thing. So it's a kind of a tax writer for somebody. And then, Nobody needs to pay, and it's just a a, a, pl- a, a good thing. I'd say that the problem with that, though, is that people just generally be too greedy. Like, <laughs> someone what's really going to do that out of the kindness of their heart, especially for the scale that it would need to be. But you must remember, it is a tax writer for, for some people, for some big businesses. And if it is for the upliftment of the, of the entertainment, the cultural thing for the country, eh, ding, 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 ding. I get, I get you, I get you. But will someone actually, you know, hop on the idea is the biggest thing. Yeah. And then uh, just circling back to like the, the nude goals and then your, your selfie solo project, do you have any new plans of music coming up? So for this year, it's our 30 year, you know, existence. So basically our first album, the Anthro one was never mastered because we didn't know what it was. They phoned us from America when we, when, when they pressed our albums or the CDs, right? And the guy phoned us and he said, did you guys, is this the master? And we said, yes. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's the master, right? 
the fact is we were so fucking green we didn't know because that you had to master an album so this year we're gonna master the album for the first time and then put it out as an lp or a thousand and we'll sell probably a thousand lps just as a celebration and then for the first time we can hear what the album would sound like if it's actually mastered which is quite cool i think um and then we are slowly but surely booking time in a studio and i've been writing since last year and i'm writing constantly with the nude girls in mind i don't know i'm I'm not at the moment pissing out fantastic songs you know, you go through these things, but you just keep going, and then they eventually do come. No, absolutely. You gotta, you gotta keep, uh, keep writing, keep going. Sometimes you just want to start singing and cling on. <laughs> but I actually, so I'm putting out my second little Afrikaans offering now. It's coming out in two weeks because uh, I did a one Afrikaans album uh, five, seven years ago, and it was quite an interesting experience. You know, because I've been writing, I've been doing English albums my whole life. And then suddenly doing an Afrikaans album was was quite a very interesting experience. Yeah, and that was the one that you guys did at the 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 shack. I mean, there was a, a live recording at the shack. Was that that one that you released seven years ago? No, not the Nudgles. That was my in my solo capacity. I brought out an album called On Blomp Dar Thing. It was a very interesting process because I had to to block some images out of my head, right? Some cultural hangups. So I was listening to a Stoichen and Neubart and Blixer Bargu and Theater of Something brought out an album in Italian and German. And it was just absolutely fantastic. And I would listen to that and I would enjoy the Italian and the, the German. And then I would put it off and write in Afrikaans. And then you got a different angle on the language. And that was a wonderful experience. You know, it, it was almost like meeting my... Uh, having a different encounter with my with some, with a friend that I've known for years, and it was really beautiful. Well, thank you so much for taking the time to have a chat with me. In closing, where can people find you? Where can people find your music? And yeah, just drop the some of the, some of the links and the handles. Okay, cool. I'm on on X, um, on a you know, whatever, and then on Instagram, Facebook. I've, what is that other thing where people make little videos? TikTok? TikTok? I'm not on it, but I've activated it. But what the fuck was I do on it, man? What uh, what what do people do on that? My my experience is the more unhinged the content, the better. I uh, I don't know. This just seems to be I'm, I'm boring, man. I, I love oh, the less I do, the better. So all the best, Anna. Thank you so much for taking the time to have a chat with me on this Tuesday afternoon. Cheers, man. <laughs>